superconductivity occurs in a large number of metals, alloys, and compounds. There seems to be no simple definition for superconductivity. Rather, we deal here with a complex group of phenomena. The superconducting state doesn't even seem to be the same in all the materials in which it has been found to exist. Thus, there are the so-called type 1 and type 2 superconductors. It will not be possible to touch in this film on all matters of interest. In our experiments, we will be using superconductors of type 1. These are easier to describe and more completely understood at the present time than the others. However, two properties are common to both types of superconductors. One is that the temperatures involved are low. The transition temperatures between the normally conducting and the superconducting phases lie close to the absolute zero. Of course, these transition temperatures vary from one material to the other. Yet, in most cases, liquid helium is required as a cold bath to produce superconductivity. The second property shared by all superconductors is perhaps the most striking. Their electrical resistance suddenly drops in value at the transition temperature. Not only does the resistance drop in value, we have every reason to believe that it goes to exactly zero. We can now make perfectly conducting circuits. Circuits in which currents persist over great lengths of time without measurable decay and requiring no external electromotive force to maintain them. Now, perfect conductivity is only one aspect of superconductivity. Superconductors exhibit striking magnetic properties as well. One of the most significant of these is the so-called Meissner effect. We'll study it in some detail later. But to begin with, we'll measure resistance in a piece of wire at very low temperatures. I have here a length of tin wire wound over a plastic cylinder. Two copper leads have been soldered to each end and rise upward through here. We will use this wire in a brief series of experiments of increasing precision to show you that the resistance of tin is immeasurably small below a certain temperature. The wire has been put into the inner vessel of a double vacuum bottle or double doer. The outer doer surrounds the inner one and is filled with liquid nitrogen. There is liquid helium in the inner doer. The two vacuum jackets, together with a layer of liquid nitrogen between them, provide thermal insulation for the liquid helium in the inner doer. The normal boiling temperature of liquid helium is about 4.2 degrees Kelvin. That's roughly 269 degrees below zero centigrade. The cover over the inner doer is at present open through this port. The pressure in there is atmospheric. So the temperature of the liquid, and therefore of the tin wire too, is 4.2 degrees Kelvin. The leads from the tin wire rise out of the doer through a simple seal. One lead from each end is connected to a battery in series with a switch, a rheostat, and an ammeter. The other pair goes to a millivoltmeter. A current of one ampere creates a potential drop of about 25 millivolts across the tin wire. Its resistance is about 25 milliohms. So, at 4.2 degrees Kelvin, tin is a normal conductor. First, we want to cool the sample of tin wire. This we do with a vacuum pump over there. It connects through valves, closed at present, to the inner doer, which will be vacuum tight as soon as I close this port with a rubber stopper. The pump carries off helium vapor. Evaporation will cool the liquid remaining behind and therefore the wire too. Secondly, we want to keep a record of the potential drop across the tin wire as the cooling proceeds. To get such a record, we remove the millivoltmeter. And we replace it with this recording instrument. 
It is a so-called XY recorder. The horizontal, or X, motion will be so used as to indicate the lapse of time as cooling proceeds. The vertical, or Y, motion is connected to the voltage lead from the tin wire. It is calibrated in millivolts. We again set the current to one ampere. This deflects the recorder to 25 millivolts. The temperature of the wire is still about 4.2 degrees Kelvin. Next, we set the recorder pen down on the graph paper and start the horizontal sweep, indicating elapsed time. The current in the wire is held constant at one ampere. The potential drop in millivolts and the resistance in milliohms have therefore equal numerical values. This is the superconducting transition. As you can see, the resistance has dropped to zero within the limits of accuracy of this instrument. The recording voltmeter has been used to just about the limit of its sensitivity. We now replace it with this high gain DC amplifier. It will be used as a micro voltmeter. The small voltages to be measured are applied here. The amplifier output is measured on a Darson volmeter, which is bidirectional with its zero at the center. We select the range in which full scale deflection to the right or left signifies an input voltage of one microvolt. 